Right. Good morning. We are going to start with a prayer from Crow. There I am. Creator, please help us to take in what we heard today with a good heart. Please help us to walk from these talks with much to share with others. Please crow, please creator, keep us open and full of love. Amen. comes from Romans chapter 2 verses 6 through 16 and 28 through 29 I will be sharing from the first nations version for Joshua's request creator will honor each of us for what we have done he will honor the ones who have walked with firm steps on a path of doing good and those who seek to live in the ways of beauty, honor, and spiritual purity. The life of the world to come that never fades away, full of beauty and harmony, will be waiting for them. But the ones who live only for themselves, who refuse to walk the path of truth and stand against the right ways of the great spirit, will face a coming storm of great anger. Trouble and sorrow await all human beings who walk an evil path. This is true, first of all, for the members of the tribes of wrestles with creator or Israel, but also for the outside nation. But beauty, honor, and peace await all who walk in a good way. Tribal members first and also for the outside nation. For the great spirit does not favor one over the other. For all the outside nations who have followed their bad hearts and broken ways, even though they have no written law to follow, will come to a bad end. Mm. All who were given the tribal law, but also followed their bad heart and broken ways, their own tribal law will decide against them. Mm. For it is not the ones who hear the law who have good standing with creator, but the ones who do what it says. If the outside nations who never heard the law naturally do what they know is right, the things instructed by the law, this natural law is all they need. They show that creation's law is already at work within them, carved into their hearts. There is a deep voice within their inner being that speaks to them about what is right and what is wrong. The good story that I tell says that there will come a day when the knower of hearts through creator sets free, or Jesus, the chosen one, will bring to light what is good and bad about the secrets hidden in every human heart. And then 28 and 29. Being a true tribal member is a matter of the heart not of blood or ceremonial law. It is the same with the cutting of the flesh ceremony. It is a spiritual matter, not a physical one. Mm -hmm. One might perform the ceremony perfectly according to tribal law for all to see, but it is not what happens on the outside. <clears throat> it is what happens spiritually on the inside that has true meaning. And such a person seeks honor from the great spirit and not from human beings. Mm -hmm. hmm. <coughs> oh, excuse me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable to you, O Creator, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Remember, Jay, are you proud of me? Well, I would be remiss in my duties as a priest if I did not remind you that today is a feast day, a very important feast day. Uh, it is the Feast of St. Valentine. Uh, so St. Valentine shows up in multiple Roman martyrologies, and his existence is also 
affirmed in external sources uh, through the Roman Empire. So this is one of those saints that may have actually existed. Uh, St. Valentine, or then Father Valentine, was a priest uh, in the third century. Uh, during war uh, with the Roman Empire, as they frequently were, um, the Emperor Claudius decided that young men could not be married and had to delay their marriages until after this particular battle was over. So St. Valentine decided under cover of darkness to go ahead and marry young couples, um, and as a result was martyred. So they uh, beat him with clubs, burned his body, cut his heart out, and then chopped his head off. Um, so we observe him as a martyr today. That's why the color for Valentine's Day is red, uh, because Catholics wear red vestments on this day. That's also why the heart is the symbol uh, for love that we have now. Uh, so even if you're observing or if you're observing what I call Singles Awareness Day today, uh, if you make it through the day without being beheaded, it could have been worse. No. So I'd like today to start with a love poem, and I promise not to be too sappy. It's probably a love poem that you're going to recognize. Uh, he drew a circle that shut me out. Heretic, rebel, a thing to flout. But love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle and took him in. This is one of my favorite poems by the great Edwin Markham. As you may know, Markham was one of the famous disciples figures of the early, early 20th century. This poem entitled Outwitted was his famous poetic summation of the disciples' church. I think I remember seeing it in the hymnal, correct? There somewhere. Not much has changed in the last hundred or so years. Uh, you can't throw a Bible in the disciples' church without hitting a heretic or a rebel. I love that about you. It's a beautiful thing. But what moves me most about this poem is that it is undeniable proof that the disciples' struggle for loving inclusion is not a facet of modernity as some of your detractors have maintained. Quite the opposite. Outwitted is proof that the struggle for inclusion is at the core of who you are and who you've always been as a community of faith. In truth, it's an int intrinsic part of your disciples' DNA. It's the mark of your particular tribe. Be proud of that. In the reading I selected for today, we heard about a covenantal people, a people united around a covenant, not an ethnic cultic covenant, not one found in the flesh, but a covenant written on the heart. Now, the diverse peoples of God have always struggled to live in the God's covenantal relationships. The Christian scriptures are filled with divisive conflicts, the most serious of which centers upon whether or not persons outside the Jewish fold can be followers of the rabbi from Nazareth. But we learned early on that covenant is not about culture or ethnicity. By the time of the high Middle Ages, the church and the state became indistinguishable throughout the Western world. Entire peoples were Christianized by force. And those who had the gall to disagree with the church were violently executed, not for heresy, but for treason. It was a dark, dark time. Because covenant has nothing to do with political fidelity or nationalistic identity. Out of this socio-political climate arose the heroes of the Reformation, who fought for the right to interpret scripture and the Christian message as they saw fit only to turn within a few decades upon anyone else within their reach who didn't understand or express the Christian message just as they did. It was a time of pointless, cyclical violence in the church. Because covenant has nothing to do with conformity and uniformity in Christian thought, worship. In the age of colonization, the imperial church and its Protestant mimic sought to colonize and Christianize their way ever westward, murdering their way across entire continents for the gospel in the name of the Prince of Peace. But what was life for so many in the West became an agent in an, of shame and torture and death for our indigenous brothers, sisters, and kin. Because covenant has nothing to do with forced conversion and cultural genocide. 
as new revival movements continued their march west, groups who called themselves Christians and disciples, who, with all of their weaknesses and blind spots, began to gather in search of a simpler Christianity where all who sought Christ were members, where the table was open and each person was responsible for interpreting the scriptures for themselves because covenant has nothing to do with denominational or ecclesial structures. You are their descendants. You hail from a long line of Christians who proudly proclaim no creed but Christ, no law but love. Honestly, it makes me a little anxious, but it works well for you. Looks very good on you. You embrace freedom, freedom of the pulpit and freedom of the pew, your polar star is Christian unity because you understand that covenant has everything to do with the life and the witness of Jesus, who many call Christ. And any attempt to put a fence around that covenant is not only schism, it is sin. It's a breaking down of what God has called holy. It is a tearing asunder of what Christ has called one. And it's time for the church universal stand and to say no more. All are welcome. All are included. He drew a circle and shut me out. Heretic, rebel, a thing to flout. But love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle and took him in. You draw some pretty large circles in the Christian church, disciples of Christ. And Winter Talk is another wonderful example of people of faith and honesty and goodwill gathering once again to erase the circle and draw it ever wider. I know you are here today because you desperately want that circle to include our native brothers, sisters in. It's hard. It's messy. It's complicated to take a seemingly endless number of threads and to try to weave them into a tapestry that honors and celebrates the diversity of the creator's people while giving shape to a true, honest picture about who the church is, who we've been in history, what we've done, and what we failed to do. Have you ever seen a tapestry woven? It's a truly miraculous process. Threads of every color and texture and size are woven together line by line until an image, a pattern is revealed. And often that image or pattern tells us an important story. Tapestries are not just beautiful though. They're strong, they're durable, they're timeless. It's no wonder that the Christian mystics have described the creator as a weaver of tapestries restlessly intertwining individual threads to bring life and witness to the gospel, ever creating the image of the body of Christ in the tapestry that is the church in all its beauty and splendor and in all its complicity, sin, and violence, shame. One side can be quite beautiful. If you flip that tapestry over, look at the inside, the tangled, knotted mess. Covenants are like that, aren't they? Movements for wholeness and healing are like that, aren't they? Churches are like that, aren't they? Look around you. We are a tapestry made beautiful in our diversity, made strong in our complexity, reflecting the image of God to a world in desperate need of this art, but we are also broken, fractured. We're knotted and tangled and frazzled and worn. And if we're honest, we're a mess, but we've got to keep weaving. That's why I love conferences and gatherings like this. They force us to reflect critically on what kind of tapestry we have woven across time and space. They call us to reflect critically on that tapestry that lay behind us. Winter Talk calls us too to reflect seriously, to look unflinchingly to that common future that we share, 
in light of an often dark, troubling, perfect past. But even now we can see that Creator is weaving a new image into the church. The work is not done. I can see a thread here and a knot there. Join me in this great work. Amen. Just a few announcements before Joshua gives us a blessing. For those that are on site, we will be going down to the commons area where we had lunch yesterday uh, to dine with the rest of the Phillips community, faculty, staff, and students that are on campus today. For those of you that are online, you will have a break to have your own lunch, and we will reconvene in this space uh, virtually and on site at 1.30 to start the afternoon program. For those of you that are on site, I know the rain is moving out and you may be tempted to take a walk outside. Please know though that our receptionist takes her lunch from one to two and no one will be at the front desk to let you back in at 1.30 and all of the other doors of the building are locked without your a badge or you know a, a fob to get in. Um, so make sure you have a plan B if you step outside and have someone waiting at the door to let you back in. All right. That's all I needed to say. You may be surprised to learn that the Shawnee deity is actually female. Uh, we call her an, uh, our grandmother. Uh, she toils still at the loom singing her creator song in and through us, crafting new covenants out of our words and our deeds, out of our work and out of our worship. Grandmother is calling us to draw the circle ever wider, even when it's hard and complicated and messy perhaps especially when it's hard and complicated and messy, because we know that that is what covenant is all about. It's about making room in that great kingdom of God. It's about healing of the body and mind and spirit and community for all of our relations, the colonizer and the colonized. It's about the power of love the wit to win. It's about drawing circles ever wider until all tribes, all nations, and all peoples fit right in. I invite you to stand if you are able and to pray for God's blessing. My prayer for you this week is that when you get back to your congregations, your lives, your families, you'll keep working on this tapestry whenever, excuse me, whenever and wherever you find yourselves. I pray that you will find prophetic opportunities to flip that tapestry over in your ministries that you'll find ways to talk about the knots and the tangles, and the imperfections. I pray that you get frustrated, angry even, at the image that has taken shape, and that you go to unwinding and cutting and cursing and refashioning and reweaving until the covenant is made good and true and beautiful again. I pray too that that covenant will be cut into your heart, that you will go home just a little sore from the wound, the parts a little more broken, a little more open, so that all the creation can fit right in. I don't need to give you a blessing. You are already blessed. In the name of the creator, the redeemer, and the giver of life. Amen.